So just before I get into today's episode of the podcast, I want to share with you a website that I've been using as an alternative to renting furnished apartments on Airbnb, and that is thebolvo.com. I'm gonna link them below in the description to this video. Now, I love using Airbnb, don't get me wrong. Um, so why would I go ahead and use an alternative? Well, first of all, I'm a former competition lawyer, antitrust lawyer, so just like the idea that there's more competition in the marketplace. And often when I'm searching for furnished apartments here in Ukraine, I'm actually in Kiev, the capital right now, I just find that uh, by looking at the competition of the alternative that sometimes it's a little bit cheaper or there's a different apartment that I actually pref would prefer to stay at that's not on Airbnb and it's something that's used more maybe by Ukrainians than international travelers because of course Airbnb is well known internationally but Debovo is well known here in Ukraine as an alternative so I would encourage you and go and look at Debovo.com if you are going to rent a furnished apartment when you're traveling in Ukraine uh, because then you get to see you know other apartments and possibly for a cheaper price also on top of everything if you decide to use the bobo.com be sure to use my special discount code it's Connor it's my name it's my first name C-O-N-O-R definitely go and type it in and you'll get 200 hryvnia off your first stay so that's about maybe about six seven euros about eight or nine us dollars roughly um, so go ahead if you're going to use the service be sure to use that discount code and and have a terrific stay here in ukraine so let's get into today's episode of the podcast right on the transistor side and pandemonium breaks out the transistors are like okay guns out out of the car like, what the hell are you up to experience. Всем привет and welcome back to another episode of the Vodka Podcast with me Connor Klein. This is the Zara experience and today I once again I'm speaking to you on an Indian summer's day in mid-October from Odessa, Ukraine, shores of the Black Sea. You can see behind me the port of Odessa. I want to give you a little bit of a look at that in today's uh, as a backdrop to today's episode of the the podcast. And if you're new to the channel, go ahead and press that red subscribe button and make sure that you've whack the notification bell beside it because that's actually how you get notified about new uploads uh, to the channel, to all channels. So if you enjoy this content, you're interested maybe in traveling to Eastern Europe, maybe that's Ukraine, Belarus, Romania, Moldova, Russia, the Baltic, somewhere like that, then make sure that you're subscribed and you've hit the notification bell uh, so that you know that you're going to be notified when I upload, especially the travel vlogs. As you can see, I'm wearing my shades because uh, it's, um, it's 3 p.m. The sun is quite high and I wanted to shoot it now before I go and do other things uh, so that's why I'm gonna wear the shades today otherwise it'll just like be give me I'll be blind by the end of this <laughs> this 20 minute video if that's the case so getting into the substance in today's episode I'm going to give you a little bit of a story time uh, podcast about when I went to well actually I was trying to come here to Odessa but it ended up having to go through Transnistria now if you don't know anything about the region, then probably you should go and just Google uh, Transnistria and read the Wikipedia page at least. So it lies just to the north of here. It takes like a little bit over, maybe it takes an hour and a half to get to its capital, Tiraspol. Uh, and Transnistria in Russian is Pridnestrovia. So maybe you've also heard that name if you speak Russian. And basically it's a separatist, unrecognized republic in Moldova. So legally it's part of Moldova, de jure, it's not internationally recognized as being independent but de facto in effect it is dependent and it's basically supported by Russia and it fought a war um, the people there in the 90s to gain that uh, unrecognized independence and for the last it must be I guess at this stage probably over 20 years maybe it's even 20 25 years at this stage it has operated uh, de facto as an independent state now if you read online there are lots of horror stories about people going there and then the, the soldiers uh, basically uh, pointing guns at you and um, uh, demanding money trying to extort money off uh, off you now I've never had that experience and I've actually traveled there quite a lot uh, that's because uh, from Odessa to Chisinau, which is the capital of Moldova. The quickest route is actually to go through Transnistria. Uh, so that's why I've actually taken that route quite a lot. I also dated a girl very briefly from Tiraspol, the capital. So I went there a couple of times to hang out with her. Uh, so I do have a good lot of experience. I've never had a bad experience. And I did make my first ever travel vlog, really basic, 
uh, it's five years ago now, uh, before I started making serious travel vlogs about a year back. And it was shot on my iPhone 5 at the time, and the, the quality is horrible, but it will give you a little bit of an, you know, a taste of what it was like uh, to go there when people really believed that you would get held up by gun, because that's what we thought when we went there. Just a little travel vlog, maybe it'll give you a few little, um, a little bit of a taste of what it's like uh, to be actually in Transnistria. Uh, I've sh have gone there with my camera, but the weather was terrible and we were only there for like an afternoon. So I didn't make a travel vlog yet of uh, Tiraspol, but I will make a proper travel vlog from there. Probably, um, probably it's going to be next year when you know we have this nice weather and I spend a week and commit to that. But I will make, uh, by, the, by this time next year, I will definitely have a travel vlog, a modern travel vlog from there. So it has this reputation as being a really odd and scary place. Um, that has been my experience, but at the same time, you're, you're entering a country that doesn't exist and that does entail certain, certain differences and issues, right? So basically what happened is that I was with a bunch of my Italian friends and we were planning to spend New Year's Eve here in Odessa Mama um, because they also have kind of a spiritual and emotional connection to Odessa, the city. And actually we all met here first um, in Odessa and then we continued that friendship over the years. And uh, we've actually hung out obviously in Italy and in other parts of Ukraine. But a few years back, it must have been about, it's probably at least three years, maybe it's even four years ago now for New Year's Eve, we decided that we would come to Odessa. And we, first of all, we agreed to meet in Chisinau, the capital of Moldova. Now I have made a travel vlog from Moldova, from Chisinau, so you can go and check that. I will link it above, also down in the description. I'll put all the relevant links to so go check that out. If you're listening to this, uh, not seen, watching it on YouTube, you're just listening on the podcast, then I will include all this in the show notes. So go check that out and then you can have a look at what it's really like to, to go to Chisinau. I have a great travel vlog from there. You'll enjoy that one for sure. And uh, so we went back in the good old days, I would say from Moldova before everybody, everyone young left this, the, the country um, to explain Moldovans today, not only have visa free to travel in Schengen, uh, in the, most of the EU uh, for six months a year, they also, nearly all have either Romanian or Russian passports. That means that they can basically work and move, study, do whatever they want in the European Union. Or if they decide to have a Russian passport, obviously they can go and, and do the same in Russia. Uh, and that basically means no one really has to stay in Moldova. So it is the poorest country in, in all of Europe, but in reality, no one really stays there. So it's quite sad. A lot there's a huge depopulation in the last few years, but this was just on the cusp of that happening. So there was good nightlife there in, in Chisinau. I have fond memories. Maybe I'll even tell a story or two uh, on the podcast from the good old days in, in Chisinau, uh, what it was like to go there maybe five, six, seven years ago. So we're there and we, we go out and we party together for the weekend uh, or whatever days we were there. It was holiday time. And then we decide, uh, well, we had already decided we're going to come to Odessa. Uh, we organized a taxi. I called on the phone. I the, was the only one in the group who spoke decent Russian. Um, I do speak Italian uh, fluently. So normally when my friends were Italian, we speak maybe 95% of the time in Italian and maybe, you know, 5% of the time in English. Uh, there's also quite a big character amongst the group, Nico, who speaks basically Abruzzese, which is not really Italian. It's not really a dialect, it's like a separate language. And that's, uh, we'll try and feature him actually just for a comical effect uh, in next time I meet him here in Odessa in the summer and put him in because he's quite a character. So he's also on the trip. Uh, so we go to leave and I've called the taxi and it should be like a you know, three to four hour journey, including the border crossings that sometimes makes a little bit longer than expected to get to Odessa from Chisinau via uh, Tiraspol or actually going around Transnistria. You don't actually have to uh, go through it in order to get here. It is quicker in general, but a lot of times, you know, buses just go around it uh, and then you just have one border crossing, which is in the south of Moldova directly into Ukraine. Um, so we go to leave and actually the landlord who had rented me the apartment in, um, in Odessa or in Chisinau, he uh, actually looked at the weather outside when he came to take the keys and said like, I, I think you should stay in Chisinau. This apartment is free you know, for the next few days. Uh, you shouldn't go to Odessa. Look at this weather. It's going to be terrible on the road. It's going to take you, you know, it's going to be probably dangerous to get there. And, and I thought my first reaction is, well, he wants to rent me the apartment. He has a little bit of a, well, he obviously has a vested interest in having me stay here. Uh, so I was pretty dismissive. I was like, no, we've already booked accommodation in Odessa for the next few days. We're going to go there and celebrate New Year's. And we prefer to do that in Odessa than here. So even if it takes a while and it's a long trip, 
and the snow holds us up, we don't really care. So it's obviously December 30th, this is day before New Year's Eve, and uh, the, it's snowing. I mean, this, this region is pretty cold during the winter. This is not representative. This is an Indian summer, and uh, it's 21 degrees or 22 degrees Celsius today in mid-October, but basically by December, it will be minus something here, and it'll be really cold and probably snow everywhere. So that's, that's the, the, those are the weather conditions that we had setting out. We all hop into uh, our, our car. We have the driver, then there's Luigi up front, and then maybe there's the two other guys, Nico and uh, Matteo in the back. I think they were, that was it. I think there was just the four of us. And uh, we take off and we head towards the Moldovan Ukrainian border. So we're not gonna go into Transnistria. <laughs> so we thought. So we uh, are maybe about, I think we went to a place called Kaushan, is that the name of it? Maybe something like that. And we had something to eat. We were pretty relaxed. Uh, not so worried about the weather. It was snowing a little bit, but whatever. We actually stopped and had some food, got back in the car. And then somewhere near, I believe the name of the place is maybe Stefan Voda. Um, it just had gotten dark. So, and we suddenly come across three or four cars just stranded in the road, right? They're not moving. So we come along near Stefan Voda and there are like three or four cars just like kind of stranded. I mean, there are people still in them, but they're not moving anymore. And the road appears to be impassable at this point. And I was actually worried that that's it. We're going to be stuck in the middle of the Moldovan countryside for the night at least, because uh, I didn't think we could even turn around. Like, uh, anyways, the, the, the taxi driver, uh, Gennady was his name, um, he managed to spin the car around and get us out. So I was pretty relieved because I mean, I had these visions of us sleeping in this car uh, overnight and uh, progressively getting colder, <laughs> uh, you know, as the temperatures, uh, temperatures drop. And he says, that's it. We're going back to Chisinau, board admission to uh, Odessa. This weather is crazy, road is closed. And I was like, nah, this is what we're going to do. Let's go at least to Tiraspol, which is the capital of Transnistria. We have to go back up a little bit in the road. Then we can cross into Transnistria go to the capital. If the road is closed at the border in the very south, uh, the border from Transnistria into Ukraine, fine. We will just turn around again and go back to Tiraspol and stay overnight at Gastinitsa Rasi, which is a Hotel Russia, which is the main hotel in the city. Uh, on, at the, but at the time, by that president, he's no longer the current president, he was kind of ousted uh, in the meantime since we were there. But at the time they had a, this president who owned the hotel, who was obviously a businessman. And um, that seemed to be, for me, the best course of action. So rather than just starting back from point A where we had taken off, at least we would be, you know, an hour and a half down the road. And then the idea was that then the next morning we just continue on with our trip. So he agrees that he's not very happy, but he agrees that he starts to call some friends. They said, oh, maybe the road's blocked, maybe it's not. Well, I said, we'll find out. So we get to the Transnistrian Moldova proper border. And of course, we cross over from Moldova. They, at the time, I don't even think they wanted to recognize that there was a border there. So we basically um, reached the Transnistrian border guards. They call me out of the car. I chat to the I, I'm, I have to go because I'm the only one who speaks Russian in the group. So I'm talking to the border guard. He's very friendly to me. He's kind of looking at me a little bit baffled though and saying like, why do you want to go to Odessa today? Look at the weather, it's terrible. Uh, and I was like, yeah, if we don't make it to Odessa, we'll just, um, we'll just stay in Tiraspol overnight. Um, and I think the issue, another issue was that when you enter tran uh, Transnistria, uh, you are given a certain time by which you have to leave, right? So you don't have to get a visa or anything, um, but they do insist that you leave by certain times. So I explained that, that maybe we would have to come back. So he wrote the time, whatever, to make it convenient for us. No problems whatsoever. Get back in the car and we head uh, along to, I guess it was Bender and then to, um, to Tiraspol and then down to the border crossing. So we get to the border crossing and of course it's already been night for a couple of hours. It's probably uh, at this stage, I don't know, maybe six, seven, maybe it's a little bit later than that. It felt around that kind of time. And we get to the border. Now, at the time, because it's a few years ago, there was a lot of tension between uh, Ukraine and um, Transnistria because Ukrainians were worried that maybe Russia would try to use Transnistria, which it supports militarily and economically, as another point of attack on this city, on Odessa. So on the Ukrainian side, they had uh, a lot more, uh, they had like, not, uh, how would you describe it? They had like armored personnel carriers, tanks. Uh, the border guards were all armed with um, 
I don't know if they were well, how you do describe the the weapons they had, but they were like maybe small machine guns. Uh, but it was definitely more militarized than it had been at the border previously, where basically they would be unarmed, uh, at least the border guards who you, who you meet, but there was a lot more weaponry at this stage. And obviously the, also that's true on the Transnistrian side, they also were acquiring weapons, the border guards. Um, so we exit, so we have a piece of paper, if I remember it was just a piece of paper, and then we gave it back to the Transnistrians, we cross over through the no man's land, uh, onto the Ukrainian side. There's a Ukrainian soldier checks how many people are in the car. They give you a little piece of paper. Then you go up and then you hand in your passports and do the immigration control to enter Ukraine. So I hand over our passports. I go up again because I'm the one who speaks Russian. And there is a uh, woman border guard there. And uh, she looks at me and she says, uh, yeah, I don't think it's such a good idea for you guys to uh, come tonight. You're not going to get to Odessa. Um, the road is blocked, um, you know, seven, eight kilometers down the road. You know, there's no village there. There's nowhere for you to stay. You'll basically have to turn around and come back here. Uh, so it's really not worth your while coming in today. Tomorrow, maybe the weather will be better and you can, you can drive to Odessa. Um, so I understand, right? There's no point in us continuing. So I get back in the car with our passports. We haven't been stamped. I say, right, that's it, guys. Let's go back to Tiraspol uh, and we'll stay at night. That was the plan B. At least we're an hour and a half down the road. That will save us that tomorrow. And then the taxi driver can come in the morning, pick us up. Uh, I guess Nitsa Resi, our Hotel Russia, um, has like a restaurant downstairs, a nightclub even, so we can have some, su uh, have some food, some sushi, and uh, probably smoke a shisha, which is a hookah, uh, water pipe, and uh, just relax and then have a few drinks, and then tomorrow we can continue on our way. And they will do the registration for us if we have any immigration issues with the Transnistrians. So everyone's in agreement with that. We come back and um, we cross over out of the no man's land to Transnistria again, right? So. The, we've previously entered Transnistria, you know, obviously in the north of the, well, the separatist enclave, and then we're already exited at the south, and suddenly we come back again. Now, the Transnistrians were not very happy to see us, understandably, because been, there wasn't really anyone at the border, and basically been just watching us go across, talk with the um, immigration, and then come back again, and they were like, basically, what are you guys doing? Right? <laughs> You're back again, you just left. Uh, what are you doing? And then I explained the situation. Hey, the Ukrainian soul is actually closed in seven kilometers. You know, we have to go back. We're going to go to Hotel Russia and we're just going to sleep there tonight. Uh, and they were like, OK, that's fine. We'll let you back in. So they give us a new sheet of paper, a sheet of paper, and they process our immigration, all the passports again. And uh, then our taxi driver, so we clear immigration. Then our taxi driver goes and he says he needs to buy some cigarettes or something in his shop, maybe get something to drink. And uh, he suddenly uh, is gone for like 10 minutes. So 10 minutes later, uh, Gennady comes back <laughs> and he has a eureka moment. So he's met another taxi driver. This other taxi driver has convinced him that we can actually get all the way to Odessa and it's not true that the, the road is blocked seven kilometers ahead. Um, so after a little bit of discussion, he was so convinced. He said, yeah, we can definitely make it. I was like, okay, well, if we can make it, we can make it. I don't care what time we arrive tonight. Um, at this stage, it's probably, you know, mid-evening so it's probably eight o'clock or something so we think oh, okay we'll still be there for 10 or 11 it's better to get there tonight we have our accommodation there just like not have to travel tomorrow we can relax a little bit sleep in and then go for new year's eve um so we we turn around so basically we've only driven like 20 meters back into transistia we just turn around and then we hand back in our slips of paper and our passports to the immigration officials to the border guards on the transition side and they're all looking at us like what well, I thought you guys were back here for good, uh, at least to spend the night. And I was like, yeah, but now this trick service comes, we can actually make it all the way. The Ukrainian border guards are not telling us the truth. So fine, whatever. Here's the slips of paper back and we'll be gone. Um, they take the passports, look at them, take the slips of paper, hand them back to us. They're like, okay, this for then, yeah. Bye bye. So we drive back across through the no man's land and we're on the other side, uh, same protocol again. Border guard greets us in the normal, just on the other side of no man's land, counts the number of people, gives us a slip of paper. We get to the border officials and they've actually changed teams in the whatever 20 minutes we have been gone back into transition for. So this time there's just there, there's just these huge guys there actually. I remember there's one guy in particular who's massive, massive. Reminds me of the story I was telling you about when I first the first moments I came to Ukraine, I had this issue about being accused of being a Russian spy. That's in episode nine, part one of the podcast. So if you haven't seen that one, go back and watch that. It's quite entertaining. And there was also a huge border guard, a guy with a huge neck. But this guy was even bigger, I remember. Uh, and he was, oh, I remember 
kind of in the window down because I had to listen when we had to speak in Russian and all I hear him say is like, why do these guys really want to go all the way to Odessa today? I wonder. Uh, so I thought, okay, that doesn't sound so, so good, that doesn't sound so friendly. So maybe about two minutes later, uh, once we're given our passports and actually try to come into Ukraine again, this guy kind of says, who speaks Russian? I said, it's me, I speak Russian. He says, okay, Bashli, let's go. Uh, let's go and have a chat, basically. So he starts walking me and away from the actual immigration booths. So I thought, this is odd. And basically we walk around the side of the uh, border post and then there's an office. He opens the door, bids me uh, into, the, into the office. So I walk in, it's like some dingy off the border office. You can imagine in, uh, you know, a border crossing between Moldova and Ukraine, what the a border office looks like. So it's quite small um, and um, at least it was warm because it's very cold outside so basically he asked me to sit down i sit down um he sits down on the table uh, in front of me he's like this huge mountain of a man and uh he's wearing obviously his border guard uniform his military fatigues in fact uh for the army and um, he starts looking through my passport he's like corner i was like yeah uh, that's me and uh looks at my nationality he says yelansky um, yeah 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 goes through everything. He said, oh, you've been to Ukraine quite a lot. You must like our country. Uh, looking at the number of border stamps I had, of course. Um, and I was like, yeah, sure. I love Ukraine. It's like my favorite place to hang out. And uh, he says, okay, tell me, why would you come to Odessa now with this kind of weather? I explained, we have, of course, this accommodation. We love Odessa. <clears throat> we love Odessa. It's a, a very emotional, spiritual place for me and my friends because we met there. We want to go and enjoy New Year's Eve and just have a great time. And tomorrow is uh, New Year's, so that's basically the reason why we're going in this weather all the way to Odessa. And uh, he kind of nods his head and he says, listen, of course you're welcome to come back to my country with pleasure as every other time. But listen, this is what's going to happen if you come in. You're going to drive seven kilometers. The road is going to be blocked with snow. You're not going to be able to drive around it. There are no houses, there's no village, nowhere you could knock on a door and ask to spend the night. Maybe, maybe you're going to be able to turn the car around and come back to us here. But maybe you're not going to be able to turn around. Maybe you're going to be trapped there like there are a lot of other cars that are abandoned on the road. And then what are you going to do? You're going to have to sleep in your car overnight. And then tomorrow we will come for some Ukrainian officials will come, workers, and maybe they can get your car. So, it's up to you. I would suggest that you turn around, you go back to Moldova, and you spend the night there, and then tomorrow come back if the weather is better. So, I reflect on this, because it's obviously a crazy situation. I've already come in, left, come in again. Um, and this guy definitely has my best interest. He seems very sincere, uh, this border guard. So I'm like, all right, this big guy is telling me, not to come in we're not coming in because obviously this is a waste of our time we're just going to get have these problems um, with respect to uh, the weather we're probably going to be trapped in our car like we almost were previously near to Stefan Voda um, so I say okay that's it fine cool give us the passport back we'll go back to Transnistria sounds easy right we turn around <laughs> repeat what we've done the last time through the no man's land between that separates Ukraine and Transnistria arrive in the Transnistrian side and pandemonium breaks out. The Transnistrians are like, okay, guns out, <laughs> out of the car, basically me, always me, of course, because I speak Russian, around the side, open up the, uh, the boots, the, 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 the trunk of the car, start searching through things with their guns, like basically po poking at stuff, or I open everything up. What the hell are you guys up to? You've already left this country twice, and now you're back again. Uh, like, we watched you, you went into this office with the Ukrainian um, border guards, with the soldiers. Like, what are you doing? What are you transporting? Like, so basically they were concerned that I was transporting uh, probably some, maybe a bomb or something back to uh, Transnistria because there's a lot of tension between the two sides and maybe they thought that there would be some sort of like bombing and that I was orchestrating it. Um, but if I was going to do that, I don't think I'd make it so obvious, to be honest. <laughs> I wouldn't be a very good uh, spy if that's what I was doing or uh, whatever, an intelligence officer or terrorist or whatever. So it was extremely stressful because at this stage I'm so tired. Basically I hadn't slept night from all the partying in Chisinau. 
and then it's obviously getting late. I've been speaking in Italian all day uh, and then now I got to speak in Russian. So just my brain is really, really starting to suffer. Uh, and I'm like, no, we don't have any of these things. They, of course, they're asking me, do we have guns, uh, some sort of um, explosive material, drugs, something like they're searching through all my stuff uh, frantically, but keep kind of indiscriminately waving their guns like this around, which isn't, you know, doesn't make me feel the most comfortable. Um, they weren't threatening to shoot me or something, but, uh, you know, I was kind of starting to get worried that in their agitation, they would accidentally uh, let the gun off. And then that would be the end of end of me here on the Transnistrian Ukrainian border. So eventually I got them to calm down a little bit. Uh, I explained, yeah, we went back again. They told us, no, you really can't. And they were like, are you stupid? <laughs> That's what you said last time. So they sent me to see the head of the border security in Transnistria, who was at the border. So I got into this office with the guy and he's just like, okay, I've been watching you all evening. You've come into the country, you've left, you come back in, you've left. Now you want to come back again. Like, what the hell are you up to? I just explained, give him a recap of everything. Obviously this is all in Russian. And uh, he asked me what I do for a living. I said, I'm a lawyer. My friends are also lawyers, which is true. Some of them are lawyers as well who are in the car. And um, yeah, we just really want to party in um, Odessa. But it, now we accept that that's it. We've got to spend the night in Tiraspol. We're going to go to Hotel uh, Russia, Gastonisa Rasiada in, the, in uh, Tiraspol, which was the hotel of the current president. And uh, in the end, he's like, OK, you can come back into the country on one condition. I do not see you back at this border post until tomorrow morning at the earliest. Because if you come back again tonight, you're leaving the country and you're not coming back again, ever. <laughs> so I was like, okay, that sounds cool. That's the end of any other dis debate or options. We are not coming back to this border post again this evening. So gives back the passports. We go to Tiraspol, we stay in the hotel, we eat sushi, we smoke shisha, um, some hookah there. And I uh, actually had a nice time. We actually had a nice meal, hung out, even though we were so tired from the trip and all this kind of back and forth and the stress in the back of the car. Sleep there overnight, next morning get up, tech drivers there pretty early, didn't really sleep a huge amount, and we head back to the border to leave and make it to Odessa for New Year's Eve, hopefully. So we get to the border, there's a huge queue of people now to get across, it takes us an hour or something. We drive seven kilometers into Ukraine, and lo and behold, what do we find? Probably between 50 to 70 abandoned cars in the snow. So the whole, the whole road was completely snow uh, covered in snow and they actually have plowed out one lane and then a little bit when they couldn't move a car made you turn it a little bit and then go down the next lane and like this zigzag basically with their um, snow plows uh, the Ukrainians uh, that morning to at least let us be able to travel along it took us about two hours or something to get to the edge of Odessa that stage, the, it was almost undrivable in Odessa. They didn't have things very well managed for snow, obviously, and the weather conditions. So basically, we had to get another taxi to come out and pick us up. I remember it was almost 5 p.m. This taxi driver came, it was near sunset, and it took us like, I think another four, five, six hours to just go the last few kilometers into the center of Odessa, get to our accommodation. Um, yeah, the whole trip, instead of being a three-hour trip, turned into uh, basically a 36-hour expedition to get there. We did get there um, in time for New Year's. We did celebrate it. I don't remember very much because the food didn't come <laughs> and I drank a lot of champagne and I was so wrecked. It uh, kind of like spoiled a little bit my, my New Year's celebration. But at the end of the day, we did achieve our mission. We did make it. Uh, so that's the time that the Transistions thought that we were transporting some of our potential terrorists and spies. I did tell you that the Ukrainians once directly accused me of being by the first time I came to Ukraine and that's the story of how we went to Transnistria and we went three times in one day and almost got thrown well, almost got banned from that country as well what can you learn from this um, that's why I tell these stories it should be not just something that entertains you but also inspires you and something a message for you to learn uh, definitely I think the key here has been able to speak Russian uh, I hear so many people tell me who've traveled in the region that they went to Transnistria, they had to pay the board guards money. I've never paid them money under any circumstances. I don't encourage you to ever pay uh, border guards money. Uh, basically, they don't have a reason to do to, that. You should have to pay them money in, in general. Um, so the fact that I spoke Russian made a huge difference. Been able to communicate in that situation when it was really stressful and just be able to uh, have that back, you know, that conversation with the head of. Uh, uh, Transnistrian, um, obviously, border control, and on the other side with the Ukrainians, and actually get all the information because the English language skills are very low in this region, so don't expect a uh, high level of English and be able to do things in English. So, 
in this region speaking at least some Russian uh, makes a big difference you don't have to be fluent don't think you have to speak you know amazing Russian spend 10 years learning in order to be able to reap the benefits just learning it for a few weeks is enough to give you that big boost that big initial start um, if you're more interested in of course traveling to the region you can write me a message uh, Connor Klein at zaraexperience.com or DM me on Instagram my Instagram handle is Zara Experience. gonna link all that below and also I'll be starting some Russian language uh, projects. I do have my general language course down there um, and you have a free course. Of course, you can check all that out in the links in the description to the video, but also I'm going to be starting soon a Russian Academy uh, to help you guys learn Russian and also help you with those first initial steps that you get a huge boost for your holiday, right? When you come to this region, you don't have to spend, you know, you just if you spend a month, month or two maximum before your trip, just a little bit every day, then you can reach that, in, that initial level that's going to give you the biggest boost it's like going to the gym you probably understand the gym like if you've ever worked on the gym like the first few weeks you go the first month or two, you get a huge boost you see your biceps bulge because just from going from zero to that just initial stage you get this huge boost and it really gives you a lot of confidence and motivation then you hit this kind of plateau and uh, i'm going to go into another video videos like i have in previous uh, episodes of the podcast where i show that actually the intermediate physical language actually takes a little bit of a dip before you get that huge spike at the end but just spending those first initial months learning language you're going to get the most value per time that you invest uh, so i really encourage you to go down and check out the links below uh, the video and get on uh, my programs about how you're going to be able to achieve, achieve that it's really going to help you out so that's the end of today's episode uh, the sun is starting to not quite set but uh, it's kind of going out of my eyes finally uh, i'm going to enjoy another beautiful evening apparently it's going to be like this for another four or five days so i'm not leaving odessa until i have uh, basically used up all that good weather for filming that's possible I'm gonna have probably at this stage you've probably already seen the summer vlog because I'm recording these podcast episodes ahead of time but definitely go and check those out I'll also link them below in the description um, if you're not a subscriber of course already subscribed but you got the end of this video so you've probably done that just make sure that you've tickled that notification bell so I wish you a very good afternoon evening morning whatever time zone you're in when you're watching this and we will talk soon in the next video maybe it's going to be next week's podcast episode maybe you'll watch the tip thursday on thursday or maybe you'll watch the other videos that come in between this this vidanya dopobachna see you in the next one sar experience